SJC 11691, Commonwealth versus Cooley. Mr. Bateman, good morning. Good morning. What I'd like to do this morning is uh, first uh, address the uh, denial of the defendant's uh, motion for required finding of not guilty, and then proceed to the, uh, uh, the denial of the uh, motion for new trial based on, uh, on uh, uh, the uh, suppression of exculpatory evidence. Commonwealth built this case on uh, a series of phone calls. And essentially, these were phone calls between uh, the defendant and an unknown third party who may or may not have had some involvement in the case, and phone calls between the victim and the same unknown third party uh, who may or may not have, have had involvement in the case. And the, uh, uh, the defendant would su suggest that the uh, uh, superficial inferences uh, that the defendant was somehow involved in a joint venture uh, resulting from this series, uh, resulting uh, uh, from the series of phone calls uh, was constitutionally insufficient evidence. Well, it's, it's more than that. I mean, he happens to be strangely present at the scene of the crime, taking a guy who's just been shot. He claims he's his god brother. He grabs marijuana from the back. He grabs a wallet or something from the dying person's pocket. You've got his jacket, which was on him, is now separate, and there's the blood of the victim, victim on it, as well as some indication of uh, that he was within three feet of a firearm being fired. He says he's been in telephone contact with this individual, but that was not true. Uh, it's more than just a few phone calls. Well, yes, but the phone calls were the were were, were the were the were the were, were the was the evidence that the Commonwealth used to really connect them to this crime. All that, all the other evidence. Uh, one is at least explainable. It's at least explainable uh, that he, yes, he was at the scene of the crime, at least after after the crime, uh, and uh, uh, you know, it, 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 and the Commonwealth went on for many many pages in, at the beginning of its closing argument, showing that this was con consciousness of guilt evidence. But still, uh, the 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 underlying basis of the, uh, that connected him to this crime was a series of phone calls. There was no evidence in the record as to who this third party was, uh, and uh, they couldn't, they, the, 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 there just wasn't any evidence of this. And so if you, if you, if you, if you, uh, and by the way, I would point out in, in, my, in my brief on, in footnote 43, I, gave a, I, I collected a bunch of cases where you have these uh, what I would consider superficial influ inferences that do not uh, amount to proof beyond a reasonable doubt of the conclusion that's suggested by the inferences. Now, if the jury were to, to base its conclusion, conclusion on, on uh, the, uh, uh, the consciousness of guilt evidence, um, I would suggest that, that that was insufficient as a matter of law. They had, the Commonwealth did not do anything to connect him to the, to, to, to the actual shooting. He, there was no evidence that he was there. There was no evidence that a third party was there, uh, or the third party at least that these phone calls came from or were made to. Um, and again, I would, uh, I would suggest that, that that was insufficient and the Commonwealth did not make the case add up, at least we on would that just, basis. So if we were to just ignore that the defendant and the victim are both in touch with uh, the same number, seven four, whatever, 7431, whatever it was, you're saying that you know, the, the, the defendant um, having uh, gunshot residue on the jacket, the defendant having the victim's blood on the jacket, the defendant reaching into the victim's pocket, the defendant taking a paper bag of marijuana out of what he has admitted he knows is a drug dealer who has a lot of money on him, um, 
that uh, the defendant lying about CV being in CVS, the defendant admitting that he's lying about his relationship with the victim, all of that, taking all inferences in light most favorable to the, plan, to the uh, Commonwealth, ignoring the phone evidence that seems pretty compelling, still wouldn't get you over the room? Again, I would suggest that the phone, without the phone evidence, all that turns into is consciousness of guilt evidence. This could have been a, this could have been a, 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 a drug transaction that obviously could something bad happened. Could have been. Okay. Could have been. Those phone calls could have been made to set up a drug transaction. Okay. Uh, there, there is no, and, 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 and there's at least enough temporal difference between the, the time of the shooting and him getting, grabbing into the car, where, by the way, he, the transference of the blood happened. Is this, I think that's isn't fairly this, obvious. Is, isn't this the closing argument? Isn't this for the jury to sort out? You, you're making the closing argument. Well, again, they have they have to they have to agree that they, that that the, the the phone calls connect him to him to a joint venture. And unless they unless that premise is met, there's a there's an evidentiary problem or constitutional a sufficiency of the evidence problem. At least that's the defendant's position. If we could turn to the exculpatory, yes. uh, I mean, I'm thinking about so if. This information that Brian Ingram had admitted to be the shooter would have come in to the defendant. Uh, it would only have mattered if the jury would have heard it. So uh, it, it, it would have changed the trial a little bit. I'm just trying, uh, in the sense that it would have tilted the focus to the fact that, okay, Ingram was the shooter. And then the question would have been asked, what is the relationship between this defendant and Ingram? Uh, is there anything in the record, either in the motion for new trial or here, that would indicate any relationship between the defendant and Ingram? As far as I know, and I've studied this case, the answer is no. Okay? That, and that's the problem. This, this case would have been a very, very different case if the, uh, if the evidence had been disclosed. Commonwealth, it would, it would have been tried differently. Uh, the defendant, the Commonwealth would have had to show that uh, now we have Mr. Ingram who's there. And by the way, Mr. Ingram also did not say anything in his statements about the defendant. Okay? All he said was, all he said Dixon, was, you mean, Mr. he admitted Dixon. to the shooting. He did not say, he did not. I, I mean, uh, Ingram, when he spoke to Dixon, didn't make any That's reference correct. to. That's correct. That's correct. And that's equally exculpatory. Um, Commonwealth would have had to, all of a sudden, uh, it, 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 it affected both, both of the Commonwealth theories, the principal theory. Now they've got a guy who admits to being the, the shooter, and the Commonwealth the, the, the never, never backed off of the, 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 their claim at the trial that the defendant was the principal, that he was the shooter. And then it also spoils... I, 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 I gather they said he was either the shooter or he was an accomplice. They didn't commit to him being the shooter. Right, they, but they, that's right. They did it in the alternative. And, and, and how was he going to... There was no gun recovered, I gather. Uh, no. So I'm try trying to think of how he, since he was right there, uh, what was, was there any discussion of the fact that there was no firearm found in the area? I assume they searched the area oh, yeah. and they found yes, the jacket. Yes, yes, they found the jacket. They brought in a, a canine, did all, all those kinds of things. There's no gun found. J Judge, Judge Rupp found the trial evidence established that the defendant had connections to Hiller. That he had? Connections to Hiller. Right. To, to, to um, well, that's um, well. He certainly, uh, uh, in his uh, statements to the police, claimed to have uh, connections to Hiller. Um, well, he was there anyway, right? I mean, Mr. Mr. Hiller was a no. Excuse me, was a known drug dealer in the I area. I guess everybody knew him to sell drugs in that area. That was the. Everybody knew him to sell drugs in this particular that, area. That was that was the what the jury heard. And I'm not sure. Well, I'm not. The, that's that. That's what. Well, the either way, says. there's a statement. He's my god, whatever, brother, or something. Uh, that, I, I think that was uh, some of the things uh, the defendant said were probably true, and some of the things were pretty off the wall. Um, but back to um, to uh, Ingram for a minute, sure. And and, and uh, the issue of the Brady issue, uh, two things. One, um, am I right that the defendant tried to exclude um, evidence about Ingram from the trial? And secondly. Am I, miss, um, am I not remembering the record correctly? Because when you said that Ingram didn't say anything about the defendant, I may be confusing the Henderson issue, but, but there was a statement that Ingram said 
don't worry, he'll be okay, basically, if he keeps his mouth shut. Was that the Henderson situation? Yes, but the jury never heard that. Right. That never got into, that never got into evidence. Uh, Mr. Henderson was the, was, was the Commonwealth's witness, uh, and, and I believe what I'm saying is, this part is in the record, that uh, the Commonwealth didn't call him um, uh, because they didn't know what he would say. And more than that, the defense filed a motion. It was a motion in limine and because defense and his investigator, and he denied, essentially denied it. Mm -hmm. So Henderson was out. Okay, so what about um, the defendant trying to uh, keep out in, uh, evidence about Ingram being the shooter? Uh, well, uh, he, uh, uh, there was, no, re there was no, no reason to bring him in, for, for one thing. The, the, for, uh, the, uh, um, there really wasn't, the defendant had no incentive at this point, given the state of the evidence, to do anything with Mr. Ingram. More than that, he tried to find, the this was a very good trial lawyer, he was not a judge, okay? This guy was, the record shows, this guy was very, very meticulous in how he, did, how he built this case. And he did everything, he tried to find, he tried, he tried to figure out who, who, who the, the, the identity of the mystery telephone, uh, but there wasn't there. But if the Commonwealth had disclosed this evidence and they knew about it and the prosecution team knew about it, in fact, one of the people who went to that interview testified at this trial, um, testified, on behalf of the Commonwealth at this trial, uh, if that evidence had been disclosed, it would have been a completely different case. I don't think Judge Rupp found, uh, she, she found something problematic, of course, with the communication between the prosecutors to, to be kind. Yes, she did. She was, she certainly did. If, if we can go back, let's, let's go to, to a 30 Gordon Street. Uh, I was a little bit perplexed in reading it, and I don't know whether there's stuff in the record that I've missed. Uh, the 7471 number goes back to somebody who was deceased, who lived at 30 Thank Gordon you. Street. Uh, there, I guess it, there's a police record that indicated that the defendant gave, I mean, that Ingram gave that as an address at uh, some point in time. We don't know it was Ingram who gave that as an address. Uh, maybe at least, at least not, not in this case. Not in this, but I mean, but wasn't there some record of some arrest of Ingram where he's listed as having yes. that as his address? I, that's my understanding. Uh, but there was nothing to connect, in this case, Ingram to 30 Gordon Street. And there's nothing in the, in the record, to, more importantly, there's nothing in the record, in this case, to connect Ingram to that cell phone. But I guess the distinction is that's Judge Rupp's footnote number 11 describes this evidence, and she says there are these connections, but it didn't come in during this trial, so I'm not going to consider right. it. Jury, jury, it wasn't before the jury, so how could it influence the jury when right, it wasn't before right, the jury? Right. I think Again, that's the reason. We, me we measure materiality, at least under the federal standard, and I would suggest even under the state standard, based like, on the evidence that was presented to the jury. No, I, I think that what, what's clear is the issue is whether or not this evidence, if disclosed, would have impacted this jury. Right. Right, and it's just, I mean, the, I, th I would suggest that the, the, any reading of the record, if this had come out, it would have been a very different trial. But that's, and let me, it's, 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 it's that statement which is inconsistent with your earlier statement. That's the interesting part. So you're saying we need to look at it in terms of this trial as a static, the evidence in trial is the evidence of trial. Yes. And then you want to add to that, okay, what if the jury had learned that Ingram was the shooter. Uh, but then you say, well, if the jury had learned that, it would have been a very different trial. Right. And so do we look at it as, we, this is the trial as it was and just add this fact to it? Or do we look at it in the sense of, this would have been a very different trial and we have to begin to see how it would have changed the way the evidence would have played out at trial? I think the answer is both, okay? I certainly think the, the former is true, but again, uh, it, 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 I'm, uh, I keep going back to the federal standard in Kyles versus Whitley, which talked about, um, essentially, is, it would've been a different trial, and it would've been a different trial. Hard question. Uh, by the way, I couldn't find any state cases dealing with this, how you measure materiality. Yeah, well, uh, we, can't, we can't have a standard lower than the federal constitution right. anyway, so. All right. um, uh, what about the issue of, this was a uh, post-Sinetti trial. Yes. So since it's a post-Sinetti trial, why doesn't Ingram just augment the, um, the evidence 
that um, the defendant um, was an aider and a better since we don't differentiate between principal and joint venture? Two comments. Um, if, if, it, if it had been, again, if it had been disclosed, it would have been a different trial because then the Commonwealth would have had to make everything add up. They would have had to prove that, that, the, uh, uh, that the defendant was with Mr. Ingram at the crime with the, same, with the mental state of, uh, uh, of the crime and that, and more importantly, that, he, that the defendant knew that Mr. Ingram had a gun. I have to be honest. I, I read that argument and I, I don't get it. I don't understand why he has to, um, why the Commonwealth has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that it's Mr. Ingram to show uh, that he's an aider and a better. Well, why, why the Commonwealth has to show the content of the consciousness of Mr. Ingram. You may be correct on that, but in front of the jury as a trial matter, the jurors want to know where was Mr. Ingram, and that changes the case. But let me, but, but let me make one other comment. This is a, po you're right, this is a post Zanetti case. And the Commonwealth got an incredible strategic advantage from Mr. Zanetti, from having the Zanetti case. Because, like you just said, they, they, you know, all they had to show was he was, they didn't have to identify, identify who, who was the principal, who was the, who was the accomplice, and all that. Um, and that gave them an advantage. If, again, if these facts had been disclosed, I don't think this court, based on this record, can have any doubt that things would have been different. I guess the, the, the problem you, you have is, is the evidence that your client is reaching into the vehicle and taking money and drugs in a robbery case. Mm. Well, that, that, those are the facts. Right. Those are the facts. Um, again, if, if this had been just a, a, a uh, drug transaction that went bad, that he, suppose he was just standing there, present at the scene of crime, presence, does, associational evidence does not make you a joint venturer, necessarily, okay? And he said, after the fact, ooh, there's, there's, let, me go grab the, let me go grab the drugs. It's a mere after, there's, there's case law on that as well. Um, I don't think that's de determinative. Obviously, that's a factor. Um, but let me, uh, in my remaining two, uh, minute or two, let me just say some, something about uh, uh, the uh, 33E argument in this case. Um, I would suggest, notwithstanding all the, the consciousness of guilt evidence, this is still thin evidentiary presentation. It was essentially, it was almost admitted at the, in, the, in the Commonwealth closing argument. I mean, at least it certainly was, I, the way I read it, it was sort of alluded to based on the telephone calls. Um, and, the, and especially the argument that, that he was the principal. Uh, uh, the, the, Judge Rupp had, her, had made her comments on, uh, on the failure to disclose, disclose the evidence, and I don't think I have to say anything further about that. Um, and finally, uh, uh, he, this, 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 the Commonwealth had a, had a strategic advantage because of Zanetti, at least from a, maybe, maybe not from a sufficiency of the evidence standpoint, but certainly, certainly from a, a practical uh, 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 trial practice standpoint. And I would suggest adding all this stuff up shows that this, uh, uh, this trial was not uh, uh, consonant with, uh, with justice. Unless the court has any further if, questions. Well, if we can go back to, I mean, your brother in a moment, and I know he's not really your brother, uh, brother. Uh, will, I expect, argue, listen, the evidence was that there were two black men who were seen right outside of the area of the shooting, that the strongest evidence of the case is that there were two men. Uh, no gun was found either on the defendant or around the area. And so the strongest argument is that he was an accomplice to the shooter and the fact that the shooter is identified as Ingram shouldn't matter a whit because whether you name the person or say it's an unidentified accomplice, it's still, his role as an accomplice is still ultimately the same. What, what do you say to that argument which you will not get a chance to respond to after he finishes what, 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 I, what I say that, Justice Gantz, what I say that argument is that if this had been, this was a jury trial, and if the jury had, 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 heard, had, had, had been presented, had, had this, if the defendant had this evidence and utilized that trial, the trial would have been very different and more, much more, or I, say, I, I would suggest a reasonable doubt would, I'm not sure it would be overwhelming, but there certainly be some modicum of reasonable doubt. 
Mr. Shepard Brick, good morning. Good morning. May it please the court, David Shepard Brick on behalf of the Commonwealth. Um, I would address the uh, exculpatory evidence first. Can um, I address in the uh, last point that counsel made, defense counsel made though, the 33E point? Yes. In consonant with justice. Uh, th this is a completely different case mm. um, with the uh, uh, evidence being ex um, disclosed, the exculpatory evidence being disclosed rev relative to Ingram. In the case of the defendant being um, the principal is dramatically weaker. And I understand that it actually augments the strength of the case as a joint venture, but it's a dramatically different case. Um, why isn't there a 33E issue here? Uh, be because, uh, and I would say because of this court's holding in Zanetti, that it doesn't, it doesn't matter um, and whether or not um, the defendant acted as a principal or as a joint venture, the jury and this court specifically held in, in the Zanetti line of cases that um, the jury may not be sure about the defendant's precise role, but ultimately determines that he knowingly participated in the crime um, with the intent required. And, and since we're punishing the intent to commit the crime and the result that happens from it, it doesn't really matter whether or not the defendant pulled the trigger. Um, and, and what I would say to the defendant's argument is that he essentially argues that the jury would have ignored the instruction, um, that they would have required um, the Commonwealth to, to establish this additional proof um, that it is simply not required. Um, a, a, as far as, but, as but, but it would have, I mean, would have affected. I mean, the problem I have with all of this, apart from the fact that there is no good reason why that interview did not do it. I know it was not you, uh, but and there's there's really there's no excuse for it. I mean, June thirtieth, they have the interview. They've got it's presented to the an, an ADA. You've got the head of homicide present. Trial is only two months away. Uh, and nobody mentions it, but whatever, I, it is what it is. Uh, right. And you're stuck with that, so you know we're unhappy with it, as was Judge Rue. Uh, and, and I'm not happy with it either. Oh, so. I understand. So, uh, but the, the part that I'm trying to sort through, and I, you heard it earlier, is that if this is presented at trial, the, there at least is some strong evidence that, the, that, that he's not the shooter, that the shooter is probably Ingram, if you credit. Right, and, that, and, and he is a prison informant who's been and charged with murder. there's gonna so. be some uncertainty as to whether he knows what he's talking about or whatever, what, what that is. Uh, but, uh, and then suddenly the focus shifts a little bit to what is the relationship between Ingram and the defendant? Is there a relationship? Mm -hmm. uh, can they connect them in some way? And that's, of course, not the way the trial played out. Right. But I don't know what to do with that because that's, of course, not how the trial played out. And it's hard for me to evaluate whether it would have made a difference right. had it played out a little bit differently. Well, I would suggest that the court should look at all of the evidence, specifically the, the footnote um, in, in Judge Roof's decision. She said that she wasn't considering. I, I think it's, it's to create this sort of hypothetical trial. I think you have to consider the other evidence uh, that was presented, uh, or that the Commonwealth wouldn't have uh, would uh, wanted to present. Um, Eric Henderson didn't testify. He was actually eluding police at the time, and it shows up in the record um, that they, they had, there was a capius issued, and they just couldn't bring him in. Um, but he his statement certainly would have tied um, the uh, the defendant to um, to Ingram. Um, I believe Ingram was uh, the defendant's girlfriend's cousin, uh, based on the Henderson statement. Um, but that, that evidence, which again, the Commonwealth wanted to put in, and the defendant filed three motions in limine to exclude, um, that there was this, uh, that, that Ingram was in fact involved, that they both participated in the robbery. Um, and so the fact that you identify the shooter um, it doesn't really. Um, can I can I see if I if if I understand this? So when we look at this inquiry, it's kind of like newly discovered evidence, mm -hmm. a motion for new trial, where we have to take that piece of newly discovered evidence, or in this case, that piece of undisclosed exculpatory evidence, mm 
and to assess how it would have impacted the trial. Right. But what you're saying is along the way, when we make that impact, we should also add to that facts the Commonwealth would have put in to rebut that evidence. I mean, I, I, I would suggest that, that, would, that, that that's what the court should do. If the court doesn't do that, um, I think even with just introducing Ingram as the shooter, um, doesn't change the overall. Proof. Are you saying that that we should add to the Commonwealth's evidence that which would be admissible because it gives context to the added evidence? Yes, because uh, to sort of think about this, hypo you know, this hypothetical trial where we've added this new piece of evidence, you can't introduce evidence in a vacuum, um, and so to say how it would have affected the jury. We can't really know how it would have affected the jury without considering how it would have affected the Commonwealth, how, how the prosecutor would have uh, responded, and considering that there is, and, and the Commonwealth certainly probably had more evidence, um, but just that, that is in this record, um, I would suggest the court should consider that. In this, this whole hypothetical trial and what is admissible and what we should con consider, um, Defense counsel, I think, told us that he could find no cases that deal with this added thing, and I assume you have the same answer? Uh, yeah, I, have, I, have, I was not able to come up with any. Um, so I'm imagining this what if. What if they had it and what if they offered it? Because if they didn't offer it, then of course it would have no consequence, so. Right, and, and that's sort of my primary argument is based on the fact that they, they argued strongly against the Henderson statement he would not have offered it at trial. But, but how is the Henderson statement going? Because the Henderson statement links not only Ingram to the crime, but it links the defendant to it. So I understand Correct. why they wouldn't want the Henderson statement to come in. Uh, was, it, was there more than that? Was there more than an objection to the admission of the Henderson statement? In terms of, I, I'm, I'm in terms of keeping of the, of the name Ingram out of the case. Yes, um, the one mentioned by, uh, the officer who, who went to 30 Gordon Street, who, t who uh, he mentioned that he was, I believe, looking for Brian Ingram or something to that effect, uh, and the defendant immediately objected and had the reference to Brian Ingram stricken from the record. So he didn't want any mention of Brian Ingram. Uh, I think that was pretty clear. Uh, that was his strategy. And is there anything in the record that indicates why the 30 Gordon Street turned out to be a dry hole? Um, in, terms of, in terms of how many folks live there and any investigation of past residents or, I mean, it does, the phone's connected to, to somebody that who died there. Do we know the age of the person who died? No. No. The only thing that was in the record about 30 Gordon Street was that uh, I believe that Brian Ingram had moved, had lived there about a year ago, a year, a year, a year before um, the Springfield police went to that address looking for Brian Ingram. Um, I, I, and it was certainly, it was mentioned in um, Judge Roop's uh, findings of fact on the motion for new trial that, you know, the, the, the Commonwealth sort of attempted to, um, but there wasn't, there wasn't uh, uh, in this record, a ton of evidence linking him to that address. Um, but, but, uh, and I, and I would just I would just sort of g w go back to the fact that you know the, all all this evidence would have done is shown who the shooter who again might have been the shooter, um, but it wouldn't again the standard is you know did the defendant knowingly participate in the crime with the intent required, um, and it, and the fact that Ingram was the shooter in no way shows that he didn't knowingly participate in the robbery. Um, particularly, and then I'd move to my sufficiency argument, because as Justice Gaziano pointed out, he was observed committing the robbery. Um, and, uh, and, and the way, and also the manner in which the robbery was committed, this was not, um, as defense counsel argued, and, and uh, that this, this could have been an afterthought. I mean, he's chasing after this vehicle as it crashes through a fence. Um, runs up to the vehicle, pushes the victim aside as he's, you know, bleeding out, um, takes the marijuana, takes uh, the cell phone, and then, you know, tells one of the bystanders, don't call the cops, Run, and then runs off, ditches the jacket, which has the gunshot residue on the cuffs, um, which, uh, and then 
does whatever with the cell phone and the marijuana. Those are not, uh, the cell phone is later recovered uh, in his girlfriend's car. The marijuana was never recovered. Um, there were some that was still found in the vehicle, but the other bag was never recovered. Um, and then on top of that, you have these cell phone conversations. And I would say there is a link uh, to linking, uh, in addition to the call, uh, but the, the number, number of calls between the defendant's number and the 7471 number, um, there were, um, the, the defendant's statement to police was that he was talking to the victim. And he um, said that he knew that the victim had gone to the CVS that night but the evidence showed that the defendant had not gone to the CVS that night. So the reasonable inference is he had to find out somehow that the, the victim had gone to the CVS, and I suggest he found that out uh, from the uh, telephone calls. Moreover, the defendant's statement, the way he describes the phone calls, um, I, I would suggest that you know, while the content of, of the discussions was probably a fabrication, um, they did line up with uh, some of the phone calls lined up with uh, his descriptions, you know, that he said he, he, he spoke to him uh, several times throughout the night um, and that he was actually on the line with him um, about uh, or just before or as the shots were fired. Um, there was a phone call um, from this unknown 7471 number to the victim's phone um, at 1217. Uh, in the morning, it lasted for about, I believe it was 62 seconds, um, and the shots, the fatal shots were fired um, around, that, around that time. Um, so there's certainly, um, the jury could infer based on the defendant's knowledge of these phone calls that either he was making them or that he was with the person who was making them. Um, now, probably the weakest part of your sufficiency argument is his knowledge that if he were not the shooter, that the, sh that the person had a gun. Right, well, and I would, I mean, I would, I would point to two things. I would first say, because they were robbing a known drug dealer, um, this court held in Commonwealth versus Cannon, that uh, intent, uh, the, the knowledge of the firearm can be inferred um, where you are planning on robbing a known drug dealer. Um, also, uh, the Netto case as well, um, it, uh, it, it can be inferred that where there is expected resistance, um, you can infer knowledge of the firearm. Um, I would also say that the gunshot residue um, certainly could also establish knowledge of the firearm, either that he was holding it himself, um, uh, which the, you know, the, the expert testified that, you know, it, the gunshot residue could dis deposit, um, you know, when someone has been either fired a gun or within three feet of a gun. And I think if he's within three feet of the gun, he certainly has knowledge of the firearm when it's when it's drawn. You, well, you can you can certainly come up with a, 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 a hypothetical where two guys go to rob someone. He doesn't know he's 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 armed, and the person from his coat pulls out a gun and fires. What the other person has no idea what's going to happen and thereby spreading gunshot residue to anyone within three feet. Right, and, and that, that's certainly a possible, but I, I, I would suggest based on, um, the, again, the manner in which the robbery was committed, was completed, um, and I, I think there the consciousness of guilt evidence also um, tilts what could otherwise be a fairly close inference um, to one that, that, that falls in favor of the Commonwealth. And, and, and this ties into the exculpatory evidence argument because if that puts you squarely in the accomplice box versus shooter box, right? You you you, uh, you have an issue with knowledge of a firearm as opposed to if he was the shooter, right? But and and I I think that again the defendant's behavior um, that you know he doesn't uh, you know he doesn't you know when if he was planning an unarmed robbery and all of a sudden someone pulls out a gun and shoots the victim, uh, the, the sort of the callous nature of, way, of, of the way he continued with the crime suggests that, you know, if someone pulls out a gun and you're sort of not expecting it, 
I think your first instinct is to get out of there, whereas his in first instinct was to run after the vehicle, chase it down, and complete the robbery. Um, and then, and then, and then I would also, uh, I mean, the, the Commonwealth didn't exclusively rely on the consciousness of guilt evidence, um, but there, there's, there's two other phone calls um, that I think um, are significant in the analysis. First is the defendant at 1225 calls the unknown number, uh, or I'm sorry, the unknown number calls the defendant at 1225, five minutes after the shooting, after the two black males were observed talking in a quote unquote panicking manner and running in opposite directions. Um, so uh, the jury could certainly have inferred that's a, a check-in call. Um, and then, in, and in, then um, the next morning, the defendant leaves. In my brief, I wrote that he left the police station at 10. One officer testified he left at 10. The other testified, it was Lieutenant Duda, testified that he actually left at 11.10 a.m. Uh, he left the police station, and not 30 minutes later, the defendant makes a, a call to that same 7471 number. Again, permitting the jury to infer that he's calling him back after leaving the police station. You're not uh, taking Justice Gaziano's example of the person who has no clue that somebody is armed until he pulls out the gun and fires. Your view is that would not be sufficient to show knowledge of a firearm. If he just pulls it out and, and fires, then I would then then it would it would not be it but if I think a reasonable inference is even if he didn't know he brought it with him he takes it out and then there's a conversation and they continue with the robbery then I would suggest knowledge is sufficient okay, okay. Any further you. questions thank you thank you